Hello, my name is Barbara Pereira, and I'm the co-founder with Jose Angel Dominguez of the Saxum Young Professionals Initiative. Our initiative is part of the Crezio Foundation, for which I'm also the chairman and CEO. Currently, I'm serving as an advisor for the Saxum International Foundation in the Holy Land as part of the Saxum Visitor Center. I am also one of the advisors and on the advisory board of the Polis Language and Cultural Institute in Jerusalem. It's exciting to be with you. Thank you so much, and we hope you enjoy the discussion. Hi, I am Jose Angel Dominguez. I am the president of Credio Foundation, and along with Barbara Pereira, we founded the Saxon Young Professionals Initiative. I also have a PhD in Biblical Theology, and I am passionate about the Holy Land. The name of our topic is Ubi Habitas, which is a quote from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 1. And it is a question coming from the disciples to Jesus. We will talk now about what is the concept of the house, and how does it become a home, and how the Holy Land is the home of Jesus. What's a house? We talk about a house being the house of God, a church. We talk about a house comprising people who live together, a family. We talk about a house that serves as a place for organizations to meet, a house of friendship. A house is contingent upon our environment, where we live, where we breathe, where we work, and where we serve. But have you ever wondered what makes that house your home? The home of Christ is the home that we think of in the Holy Land. And our home as Christ followers is our eventual place of rest and glory, our home of heaven, where we'll be forever. But here on earth, we have to live somewhere. So our dwelling units, our houses, how do we make them truly a home? Let's see how Christ lived with the Blessed Mother Mary and St. Joseph and how his house in Nazareth became a home. So what makes a house a home? I would say it's love. Love from God our Father, love from our brothers and sisters, and love from our soul for each other. That's exhibited by Jesus in his house in Nazareth with St. Joseph and our Blessed Mother Mary. Let's learn a little bit more about that house. Well, what we know about the family of Jesus and his house is very specific according to the Gospels. We start in Nazareth, in Galilee, in the north, and then they have to go all the way to Bethlehem uh, for the census, and they didn't find a place to stay. It could have meant that there was no place at all because the whole village was full. It was a small village anyway. But it could also mean that there was not an appropriate place for Our Lady to give birth. So they will have to go and, um, and stay and dwell in a specific place, which is a, a cave. It's the place that uh, was used for the animals. We can think that uh, in that time the houses were built over the rock, taking advantage of the sun cavities so they can gather inside the cattle and then they can stay over it. So a place like this will not be in the middle of the, of the forest or will not be in the middle of the desert. It will be close to the village and accessible and it will be a place that is empty of people because the houses at that time will all be surrounded and, and will be looking to each other. So they will look for an appropriate place. It was a little more comfortable. But after the birth of Jesus, what happened with the family? Where did they go? Uh, we know from the gospel that uh, the persecution from King Herod forced them to go out, to, to leave the country and go to Egypt. But according to the tradition, before they left the country, before they escaped to Egypt, they stood for a, for a few weeks or for a, for a time in a small house close to the nativity place. 
in a, when they have the chance to go inside a house with a baby boy. And that is a place where, where we still conserve, it's called the Grotto Milk, and it's still uh, possible to visit when you are going in a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. That location is the Grotto Milk, which is few steps far from the nativity place, and it is a place where, according to tradition, Our Lady and St. Joseph keep the baby for a time before they escape to Egypt. Uh, it was a, a simple family with their own resources. They also got the gifts from the wise men, according to the Gospel, so they will keep enough for themselves and probably give this, the, the rest to people need, that need more. And once they came, uh, they came to the realization that uh, the kid was going to be uh, persecuted by Herod, uh, Joseph took the family and they and led it to, to Egypt. So what can we learn about it? It's interesting, I think, to realize that uh, God became flesh in a specific time and place. It didn't happen out of thin air nowhere. No, it was located in time and space exactly where he wanted to be. For centuries, it was preparing the, the specific time when uh, he will become a human, he will, he will become 100% human, staying 100% God, and that specific place is the Holy Land. Yes, so God became flesh, and he became human. He was a human being, and he still is. And it happened within the family, within the house. It's interesting to find out, that, uh, to, to realize that uh, the house is not the building itself. Because the house was the house of Nazareth, but then there was the house of, of Bethlehem, and then the Grotto Milk, and then they have to go to Egypt. So the specific location is not what makes it a family. What makes it a family is the atmosphere and the connection between the people, the attitude they have with, uh, among themselves, and the biological connection between Mary and Jesus, who, get, uh, who was... So I think it's interesting to realize that what makes it a home is not the walls of the house. Because they were in Bethlehem, but they were also in Nazareth, and they were also in Egypt. They were moving around, but they were staying together. That's what makes it a family. They love it in themselves. Another element that I think is interesting is the fact that God chose a person to be the father of the family. It was not needed because of the uh, miraculous conception of Our Lady that we celebrate in, on December and uh, the 8th. But the question is that still God wanted to have the figure of a father for Jesus. God wanted for himself a father when he was growing up in this, in this land. And as we see in the Gospel, Joseph took very seriously that mission in his life. I think it's interesting to know that uh, there are no words spoken by Joseph quoted in the Bible. He's a silent character in the Bible. In the Gospel, Joseph never speaks. He acts. He takes over the responsibility and he pushes it till the end, even if it is a, a hard burden to be concerned about the pregnant woman going all the way to Bethlehem, looking for a place to stay, the contradiction, the persecution, they have to escape. And then for years, he was just taking care of the family and teaching Jesus how to develop a job and how to connect with the society around we can see in the Gospel later on when Jesus is preaching that he is very well known as a father. He was a, a handy person, a handyman. He was a, a, the person working with his hands. And they also said the son of Joseph. So everybody in the surroundings knew very well that Joseph was the one who taught him his job. That he was the one who made him present in the social life, in the work market, available for the rest of the people. And creating a great atmosphere back home when they were united. And we still have a third element, which is the reaction of God being a human, as a, as a kid, as a son, as a child of the family. He was someone who was working, who was learning, who was growing. According to the gospel, he was growing with them. He was learning. He was learning from, from mom. He was learning from dad. He was developing as a human being. And he was subjected to them. Era subtitus illi, said the gospel. But he still needed to perform to, rea to take to completion his mission. So we know this scene when he, when Jesus went to the temple, when they were going a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and Jesus separated from his parents, stood in the temple for a few days, and then they came looking for him, and he replied, 
me shevat iskuya iskuya patri me isun to portet me ese. Didn't you know that I have to be with the things that are of my father, that belongs to my father? And that that is something very interesting because we will think, okay, you are 12 years old, you should not run away and at least not telling them. But it's a very interesting point because his father is God. And the Holy Family has the reference of the Holy Trinity. They are always looking at God. And they are always looking at Jesus, who is God. That is the centrality of Jesus in the world. We will try to find out who is the Father, who is the Father. But then Jesus will tell Thomas, so long with me and you don't realize that me and the Father, we are one. Jose Angel, what can you tell us about our home as Christians in the Holy Land? The land where Christ walked, the land of our heritage. Some may call it, and some of the fathers of the church have called it, the fifth gospel. What does that mean? Yes, so I like to uh, make an exercise with uh, the pilgrims when I'm traveling to the Holy Land, when I'm going with them in a pilgrimage. Uh, I like to tell them uh, to close their eyes and try to imagine uh, their hometown and the small patio or the, or the place where they used to play when they were kids. And try to fill it out full of colors and for each one of us will come a different image. I am originally from Sevilla in Spain, so for me it's a, it's a bench with an orange tree and a garden. Uh, I don't know, maybe for you it's a different place. Each one of us will have a different memory when we were kids about our home, right? And we can also think about what comes to our mind, and this is the second part of the exercise, what comes to my mind when we think about the Middle East? And some people will say, okay, I can, I can imagine a desert, the camels, the oasis. We can think about uh, the nomads walking around. Okay, that, that's possible. But I think it's interesting. What will Jesus say if we ask them these two questions? If we ask them, close your eyes and think about your home. Close your eyes and think about the Middle East. So in both cases, the answer will be the same, because his home was the Middle East. The memories of our Lord when he was a kid will be those places and those smells and those sounds that are linked to the Holy Land. And those places and those sites are still there for us to go and visit, to connect with them. So yes, the holy sites are there for us, are there for us to visit and to know and to understand better. And those places are the memories, the living memories of our Lord. It is true that some of them have changed through time. Some of them have changed a lot through time. For example, the place of the Cenacle is very, very difficult to understand how it was when you are visiting. The holy Cenacle, the place where the, uh, the Last Supper took place, is, it has been changing their, its shape. But still, it is in place in Mount Zion, connecting to Jerusalem, very close to the Kidron Valley. So the holy sites are exactly there. And at the same time, some of the places are still like they were. For example, we can think about the Sea of Galilee, how the lake resonates with the biblical context. How does it show us what was the place where Jesus wanted to live, that he was walking on those waters, we can still go and visit that. We can go and, and stay in connection with the locations that Jesus chose for himself as a house, as a home. Jose Angel, we know that Christ walked along the shores of the Sea of Galilee for three years living with his close, close friends, the apostles. But what can you tell us about the family in which they created amongst themselves? And how did they live? Where did they work? What did they do? What was that family like, a family of brothers that they created? Tell us a little bit if you can. So one point that I think uh, we have to pay attention is the diversity among the apostles. There were not just a group of friends that became followers of Jesus. Some of them had a connection, like they were brothers or, or they were uh, partners. Uh, Andrew, uh, Peter, John, Jacob, but others were not related to them. For example, uh, we have uh, one of the, um, of the apostles being a zealot. That's a guerrilla. That's a fighter. <laughs> That's the one who was trying to take out the Romans of, their, of the promised land. He really wanted to fight them. And he was one of the members uh, of the apostles. And 
But we also have St. Matthew. He was a publican. He was one taking taxes from the Jewish people to the Romans. So that would be politically the opposite of the zealot. And uh, they were together as a, as a connection, as a family, as a, as a group of people that uh, sit together to have lands, that go together with the, with the master, that goes on and on in their mission. Uh, we have very different ones there. And I think that something that brings them together is Jesus himself is the only reason why they will be gathering around. They will even be fighting. And we remember those scenes of the gospel when Jesus was a little upset with them because they were walking and fighting. Who will be the, the ruler uh, when, when the kingdom of, G uh, of God comes to, to fight, to, to be a reality? And Jesus was not surprised. He understood their situation. They come from very different perspectives, very different backgrounds. They were very diverse, different skills, different attitudes. Uh, and still, they wanted to be together. So creating a new family, creating this connection, is based on the love and the respect for each, uh, each one of the members. And I think that Jesus has a perfect experience about that. He brought what he learned with Mary and Joseph, and he brought it to his new family, which is the family of the disciples, the family of the apostles. And that family will later be split because of the time, the circumstances, the, the mission they have. And they will go all around the world, still connected in their hearts, but taking the message of God all around the world. Well, so thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed and you can take some, something out of it. Uh, we would like to stay in contact, so if any of you would like to connect with us and be in connection and know more about the connection between the Holy Land and the life of Jesus and the Gospel, uh, the family uh, atmosphere, uh, we would love to be in connection and, and keep talking.